All right, so we're continuing with our lesson on the life of Jesus and uh, we're going to be working on the section of His ministry that spans from the third Passover to the beginning of the last Passover week. That's where we are in our big, uh, you know, our, our overarching uh, uh, division. Uh, during this period, Jesus will spend a lot of His time in and around Jerusalem teaching and dealing with the Jewish religious leaders. And in the end, they will reject and threaten Him and He will once again retreat to the Northern Territory before He makes His final entry into Jerusalem, the last time to suffer and of course to die and then be resurrected. So we start with event number 95, Jesus at the Feast of dedication. So that would be John chapter 10 verses 22 to 42. The Feast of Dedication, <clears throat> interesting uh, Jewish feast. Feast of Dedication or lights or Hanukkah called today. It was an eight-day <coughs> feast commemorating the time when the temple in Jerusalem was rededicated after having been desecrated by a foreign king. Uh, Antioch, excuse me, Antiochus IV, that's it, Epiphanes I think he was called, a Greek ruler uh, invaded, there was a struggle, there was a time of war, um, and one of the things that he did was forbade Jewish worship and he tried to bring Greek influence into Jewish life and culture. Um, he brought unclean things and animals into the temple. It is said that uh, he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple, knowing full well that this would desecrate the temple for the Jews. The Jews revolted. We call it the Maccabean Revolt. Maccabees, the family who led this sometime uh, before, about 200 years before Christ. So the Jews revolted and they regained their freedom and they set about to reinstitute public worship and also to re rededicate the temple. And it was during this time, well, an interesting thing, it was during this time of religious renewal that the party of the Pharisees rose up. Pharisees, their name means separated ones. They rose up to champion the purity of Jewish life and Jewish tradition and Jewish scripture in rejecting foreign influences, especially at that time Greek influences that were invading Jewish society. And so at the beginning, the Pharisees, they were the heroes. They were the heroes of the people. They stood up and they said, no, we're not, no foreign influences. We need to keep the scriptures pure. We need to keep our traditions pure and so on and so forth. So at the beginning, they were heroes. 200 years before Christ, if you're wondering where does that party come from, they rose up during the time of the Maccabees. Anyways, uh, when the temple was rededicated during this time, the lamp in the temple uh, was relit, but there was only enough oil for one day or one night. The sacred oil, the oil that only the priests could use. And according to Jewish writings, that be the Talmud and also according to Josephus, not the scriptures, there's no writing of this in the, in the Old Testament, but according to intertestamentary writings, the lamp lasted how long? Anybody knows? Eight days. They only had one day of oil, but it lasted eight days. And so this event was commemorated with the Feast of Lights, which brings me to the menorah. The modern celebration uses a menorah. There are all kinds of styles, by the way, but one of the things about the menorah, notice there are eight, room for eight candles and one center candle. The middle or the top light is called the shamash, or the sentry, and it was lit first to provide useful light in order to see. Uh, and then the other eight lights were lit afterwards. The reason for that is, according to Jewish tradition, Jewish law, not scripture, but Jewish law, the lights that were lit for um, the celebration, for Hanukkah, for the Feast of Lights, these lights, I'm pointing to my computer, should be pointing here, these lights here, camera, 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 
these lights here were to be used only as witness. They were a witness of what had taken place. You were not allowed to use these, this flame for any useful purpose. You couldn't light another candle with it. You couldn't even use it as light to see. So this light here was lit first, the sentry, and it had a utilitarian purpose. It allowed you to be able to see what you were doing in order to light the other lights. Okay? And then of course, um, they would light one light each night for eight nights. And so um, uh, this was the uh, Feast of Lights. And uh, so during this occasion, during this feast, during this time, uh, Jesus declares His oneness with God and the Jews try to kill Him for now the third time. And He appeals to them to believe based on His works alone, but they refuse to do this and they try to seize Him. And He escapes to Perea, which is near the Jordan River, where He had before worked with John the Baptist and the people there were more sympathetic uh, towards Him. Event number 96, ministry to Lazarus, Lazarus in Bethany, Luke 13, 22, and John 11, 1 to 16. So during his preaching, he receives word that his friend Lazarus is deathly ill and that he is needed. Familiar story. Jesus purposefully remains for several more days before returning to Bethany to care for Lazarus. Now the apostles are afraid, you know, they're afraid and they're confused. I mean, first of all, Jesus refers to Lazarus as asleep, so they question why they should go to Bethany in the first place. I mean, Jesus has to tell them in plain language that he's dead, not just sleeping. They really didn't understand you know, what the rush was. And then they're afraid to go near Jerusalem. Bethany, as I said to you, is only about two and a half miles from Jerusalem. Uh, because just before, remember I just said the event before during the Feast of Lights, they were trying to kill him. So they're thinking, well, why do you want to go back? You know, I mean, it's just across the valley. Why do you want to go back to Bethany? You'll be recognized. We're, we're having trouble there. So Thomas, of course, doubting Thomas, breaks the log jam, you know, going back, should we go, shouldn't we go, so on and so forth. Should we go with him? Should we let him go alone? So Thomas breaks the log jam by declaring he's ready to die following the Lord. So eventually you know, they all fall. Isn't that the way a lot of times? You, know, you want to do something, you want to do a project, you're having a meeting, whatever, there's going back and forth, and then finally says, you know what, I'm in, I'm, I'm going for it. And people tend to follow that type of leadership. Number 97, another threat from our friend Herod, Luke 13, 31 to 35. Now while this was going on, this business with Lazarus, Jesus receives other news that would normally prevent him from going into crowded or public places where he was known, like Bethany. The Pharisees, whether they're trying to scare him into retreating or hiding out or whether it was a legitimate threat, they come to him with a message that Herod is out to kill him. And so Jesus, of course, responds that although cunning, Herod cannot really hurt him because his time, his ministry, is not yet fulfilled. God's still in charge. No matter what the king wants to do, God's still in charge. So now the Jews are after him, the king is looking for him, but Jesus is not deterred from going to his friend and also finishing his, his mission. So it's at this point that Jesus laments over Jerusalem knowing that the people were going to reject him. Imagine doing all this work and everything, he knows what's, he knows what's waiting for him. Now there would be more miracles and more teaching, but Jesus knew and declared at this point the final outcome of the Jewish reaction concerning Him, and that would be rejection and death, and of course, God's re reaction concerning them. You know, he knew what, how they were going to react to Him, and He also knew how God was going to react to them. And so He laments both. You know, I, I keep emphasizing the fact that Jesus, of course, the Son of God, but He became a man with the same feelings that men have, and men don't normally eagerly go to torture and death. You know, I don't know anyone that goes eagerly towards that. 
So Jesus, as the, the man part of him, is not eager for this to happen, but he knows it's an eventuality. 98, the curing of the man with dropsy. Notice all the stuff. You know, we read sometimes in some stories, he gets the word about, about, uh, about uh, Lazarus and then just says a couple of days goes by and then he goes, but all the stuff that happens during those couple of days. This is Luke 14, one to six. So between the time of the news about Lazarus and his eventual arrival at Bethany, Jesus spent several days continuing to minister and uh, to heal. Now one of these healings is of the man with what they call dropsy, who came to him or was put there to test him by the Pharisees. Now apparently he's having a meal with Pharisees and others when the person suffering from dropsy, dropsy is not necessarily a disease like, a, like leprosy or anything like that, but it's a symptom. It's a symptom of heart or kidney or liver disease and usually uh, it's, it's the, the, the symptom is the swelling of the body due to water retention. And those of you who've had any type of problem like that can know how discomforting that can be. So this is what this man had. So the Pharisees were waiting to see if Jesus would heal this man on what day? Sabbath. The Sabbath, yeah. And he knew he would heal him, just wanted to see if he'd do it in such a way uh, to be able to you know, accuse him of something or challenge him. So Jesus asks them if they would save one of their animals on the Sabbath, and if so, why condemn him for saving a human being? And of course, he went ahead and cured this person. And the story tells us that they had no reply, and there is no reply to that, absolutely. 99, the parable of the Great Supper, Luke 14, seven to 24. So after the healing, Jesus speaks a parable concerning the guests that were at the meal. And during this discourse, he teaches actually several lessons. First, he says, don't take the best seat until invited so you won't be embarrassed. And of course, his teaching is about the, the kingdom, right? The parables are about the kingdom. How do things work in God's kingdom? And of course, here the principle of the kingdom is that those who raise themselves up will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be raised. And then another lesson, he says, don't do good to get a reward or a favor returned. Is that a bad thing? I mean, is it a bad thing? You do a favor, somebody who legitimately needs a favor, you do a favor for them, and maybe there's someone, there or someone in a position to be able to bless you back? I don't think that's a bad thing. I've done favors for you know, a neighbor, uh, you know, lent him my lawnmower, he's lent me his power thing. You know, we, we all do that, it's not a sin this power thing. <laughs> you know, for Father's Day, anything with, that plugs into 110. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, do, if you're really going to do good that counts in the kingdom, do good to help those in need regardless of what they can do for you. Your reward for good is always from God, no matter what the world does or does not do. Your reward is always from God. And that sounds easy, but that's not so easy. You know, sometimes when you do your best, and you've carried the load and you know, you're working somewhere, and you know you've carried the load, but somebody else gets the credit. You know, when that happens over and over and over again, that gets old. And Jesus is guaranteeing us as Christians, God always sees what you do. He sees the bad, obviously, but He also sees the good. As Christians, His point is, we're looking for the reward that God gives us for what we do, not man. Because man, you know, it's spotty. It's spotty. I, I heard on there, we just, I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but I heard on the news you know, that Kim Kardashian, <laughs> you ought not to know who she is as good Christians, <laughs> but anyways, I guess, I guess you're listening to entertainment tonight like the rest of us, but anyways, that family made 65 million bucks last year. Is that fair? I wouldn't mind getting paid millions of dollars just to wear somebody else's jewelry and clothes. You know what I'm saying? So my point is, let's not look to the world for fairness or reward. That's not where our reward is, is coming from. Okay, then he says, those who refuse God's invitation to be with Him will be left out and others will take their place at the heavenly banquet. And obviously that was a, a shot across the bow for uh, the Jews that were there. 
So this parable was meant for these Pharisees who refused God's invitation to the heavenly banquet through Christ, thinking that they could get there without Him. But once again, Jesus warns them that one way or another, God will be glorified. If the Jews don't do it, then He's going to receive glory by honoring the Gentiles. We've finally gotten to event 100. Boy, two months, over two months, we get 100 events in a row. And the hundredth event is the cost of discipleship lesson, Luke 14, 25 to 35. So after leaving the banquet, remember this is all the same thing here. He got the call from Lazarus, all these things are happening in between that call and the time he actually gets to Lazarus. So after leaving the banquet, he continues to teach the crowds that follow him. And he teaches them more deeply on the meaning of discipleship that it's more than just following Him around to witness the miracles and listen to His teaching. Discipleship requires several things. Get my little clicker back here. Number one, it requires absolute devotion to the Lord beyond that of family, even one's own life. You know, the point was that anyone or anything that becomes an obstacle to the following of the Lord needs to be overcome. And it doesn't have to be a sin. If it comes between you and Jesus, it needs to go. I mentioned this example before, but I remember a lady way back when I was just starting to preach and she started playing golf because it was good for her. You know, she wanted to get out and get fresh air and she'd play on the weekends, you know, Fridays and Saturdays, and pretty soon she met some buddies and she was a member of the church. And she started playing on Sundays once in a while. If there was a tournament, if there was a tournament, and then, you know, tournament or no tournament, if the weather was nice. And then it was always. And when I spoke to her about that, I said, really, do you really think you ought to just abandon you know, public worship some sort of to go play golf? And she says, oh, I'm with God on the golf course. He's my buddy. We're talking on the fifth hole, the seventh hole. <laughs> you know, I pray for him to help me you know, with my driver. <laughs> You know, is golf a sin? I hope not, because I'm sinning every Monday on my day off. <laughs> of course not, but you know, it's a silly example. But you know, sometimes little things get in between us and our, our discipleship. <laughs> Second thing we, he talks about is a willingness to suffer. Willingness to suffer for the Lord and one's faith is, necess is a necessary component to being a disciple. Why? Because suffering is part of discipleship. I never met a disciple who didn't suffer something. So the willingness to suffer, not, not searching for suffering, that's masochism, but the willingness to suffer, the understanding that this choice that I make to be a disciple and invested, I am invested in my faith, I'm invested in my following of Christ, that's going to cost me something. And sooner or later, it's going to hurt. If we, if we haven't been mature enough to understand that, then you know, we, we're not going to last very long as disciples. Readiness to go. Understanding that discipleship will require all of these things and a readiness to go ahead anyways. And also a readiness to go where the Lord leads us. It's not always geographical, by the way, where He'll lead us in service or whatever. And then um, non-conformity to the world. The desire to live life in such a way as to make a difference in this world and not be conformed to this world. More people lose their souls because of carelessness. Not, you know, very few you know, murderers, rapists, you know, thieves. You know, usually just plain old carelessness. They're just sloppy, spiritually sloppy. So Jesus regularly pruned His disciples with these teachings to cut away those who were just curious or who didn't really believe or who loved sin more than they loved God. You know, in many ways, Jesus continues to do this today by forcing us every day to choose Christian living over sinful living, to choose the Bible way over man's way, to choose church life over worldly life, to choose quality over quantity, purity over popularity, devotion over dynamism. Every day, it's always the same thing. This is, 
This is what life is about. I used to tell our children and still do, your life is not about your job, it's not about whatever. It's about this stuff. Play it against the backdrop of your job and your family and your hobby and your whatever. This is what life is about. All right, next event, the parables. They just follow right along. Parables of lost people and lost things, uh, Luke 15, 1. So one, once the banquet is over, Jesus moves about to the general populace and is crowded by publicans and sinners. Remember, they're always following Him around, right? We, we established that idea. He's always being followed around by people. And they want to hear Him teach and preach. He's been dining or eating with the Pharisees, very specific things that He's saying to them, and perhaps close disciples who want to be near him all the time and now he moves out to a wider audience. So the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled about this, accusing Jesus of associating and eating with undesirables. And his response to their criticism was to tell the crowd several parables. He tells them about the, uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And the point of all these parables was twofold. God searches for those that are lost even if it's only just one. And secondly, God rejoices when the lost are found, no matter how lost they were. No matter how lost they were. Isn't it a sad thing? I don't know about you, some of your elders, preachers, you know, deacons, so on and so forth, you work with people, you, you've, you've studied with, isn't it a sad thing when somebody says to you, oh, I'm, I'm just too far gone, God doesn't want me. I mean, my heart breaks when I hear somebody say that to me. I mean, I want to go, no, no, no. But people have said that to me. Oh, I'm just too bad. I'm just too bad a person. Or I'm going to wait till I'm a little bit better to become a Christian. Or I'm going to wait to overcome my problem before I go to God and repent and you know, kind of be restored. And I go, no, 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 you got this backwards. <laughs> First of all, you'll never be good enough, so you might as well come on in now. And if you're a Christian and you're messing up, well, that's okay, because that's what Christians do. They, they, they mess up. That's, that's what the cross is there for. So the Pharisees and Jesus in general, uh, excuse me, and the Jews in general had forgotten that God's mission and their purpose was to save lost man. They thought God simply chose them, the Jews, as His people and rejected the rest. And all they had to do was wait for Jesus or the Messiah to come and get them. You know, fortress mentality. But Jesus reminded the sinners that there was hope for them and rebuked the Jews for having neglected their original mission. And what was the original mission? To be a light unto the Gentiles and prepare the way for the coming of the Savior of the entire world, not just the Jews. 102, parables of the unjust steward, the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16. See how they all kind of flow together? The parables to the crowds were followed by two parables spoken this time to His disciples, probably as they traveled along on their way to Bethany and Lazarus who awaited. So the unjust steward, you know, the parable focuses on a disciple's need to serve only God and to do so sincerely and faithfully. Um, this is where he says, you know, if you're faithful in little, you're faithful in a lot. And you can't serve God and mammon, can't be worldly, you can't, have, you can't use worldly methods and attitudes in the kingdom. And then the parable of rich men and Lazarus, this parable warns of the proper use of one's wealth and blessings to serve the needs of others, especially those who suffer. Also show the finality of judgment once it is pronounced. You know, we have rich men and Lazarus, you know, Despite our economic problems, you know, we're, we're the rich man. You know? Haiti is Lazarus. Haiti is Lazarus. These places where you know, the struggle each day is not, how will I fulfill myself? That's not their struggle. Their struggle is, am I going to eat today? You know, am I going to eat today? So 
we have to think you know, on, a, on, a, on a wide basis at times that we're, we're the rich man in this world and there are many Lazarus that are lying about. You like the way I say about? Pretty good, eh? He also showed the finality of judgment once it's pronounced. So Jesus warns that the word, His word, will be the standard by which we are judged. We need to believe it. Those who saw signs, those who didn't, both will be judged based on their obedience to God's word. 103, more instructions to the disciples. Man, is he ever going to get to Lazarus' place? Lots of stuff going on, Luke 17, 1 to 10. Again, Luke describes further teaching and training that Jesus gives his disciples as they travel towards Bethany. So he warns against making others, especially children, stumble. And there's the teaching on uh, generous forgiveness. You know, if he repents, he says, forgive him seven times 70. The power of faith, you know, the, the teaching on the mustard seed and the, the duty of disciples is to serve the Lord. If we do this, we have done what was expected. Always sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? When he says, well, if you've, if you've done what you were supposed to, you know, you've done what you were supposed to. You're not, you don't deserve any credit. I want to tell you something. There is great joy in knowing that you have served the Lord properly. There's great joy in that. You know, if, if I know that I've done the right thing according to God's word, I don't need anybody else telling me, good boy. That life, that spiritual life that is in me and in you through the Spirit, that's the satisfaction, that's the food. You know, Jesus says, I have, I have food you don't even know about. He didn't say, I'm the only one that could have that food. We can have that food too. When I do God's will, when I share the gospel with someone else, when I lift the burden of guilt and shame off of a person, not me personally, but when I, when I lift that off of them, how? By preaching the gospel to them, by making known to them the way to, to be free. I don't need anybody in the whole world to tell me, hey, way to go, good boy. Are you kidding me? Uh, me, the servant. I've just done what I'm supposed to do and I'm so happy because I don't always get it right. That's what Jesus is talking about. So much of the disciples and the apostles' training you know, took place during these trips as they walked back and forth, up north, back south, over to Bethany, back again, hours, days of walking. That's when the teaching happened. 104, finally we get there. Jesus raises Lazarus over in John now, 11, 17 to 46. So Bethany was, as I say, about two and a half miles from Jerusalem and it has taken Jesus at least four days to get there, probably more since he's already in the tomb. Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha, we know that, and Jesus stayed at their home when he was in the area. So we know the story, Martha meets him before he gets to the village, she's upset because he didn't get there on time, but she wants reassurance that her brother will resurrect you know, at the end. And Mary also meets him and is more bold in saying that he could have saved him from death had he come earlier. She's just overcome with grief. And Jesus is also overwhelmed by human emotion at the death of his friend and the sorrow that it's caused other, other people. So with only a few words, he calls Lazarus to come out of the tomb and we know the story, Lazarus does come forth. In his prayer, we learn that the reason for the delay was to be able to perform this great miracle and glorify God through Lazarus' death, also to provide yet another sign of his identity as the Messiah. Event number 106, uh, 105, excuse me. The high priest decides to put Jesus to death, John 11, 47 to 53. Talk about blindness. I mean, some who saw the miracle were amazed and believed. Others brought the news to the Jewish religious leaders and what do they say? Man, we got to get rid of this guy because if we don't get rid of this guy, what's going to happen to us? We're going to lose our spot. We're going to lose our place. So then they say, okay, let's just kill him. <laughs> These were learned men. Think about it now. They're going to plot to kill a guy who's just raised another guy from the dead. Not too smart but the blindness that they had. 
So now we have the king, we have the religious fanatics, we have the lawyers, and now the high priest all in league to take his life. The circle of his enemies is now complete. And so 106, familiar story, Jesus retreats to the north, John 11:54. once again he avoids a situation where he could be taken before the time is right. He leads or he heads north near the border of Samaria, not quite into the region of Galilee in a place called Ephraim. And here he's going to stay and minister until the final Passover week when he'll return to Jerusalem for the climax of his ministry. Two lessons here. Surely you can come up with others, but two I want to remind you of. I want you to notice how Jesus was focused, so focused. Note that in all this activity and traveling and threats and confrontation, Jesus remained focused on one thing and one thing only, and that was His ministry to the people. He spent little time defending Himself against His detractors or hiding out from those who were intent on killing Him. He also didn't use up too much time feeling sorry for Himself or being depressed. He remained on task every day, teaching, training the disciples, preaching to the crowds, dealing with the scribes, ministering to the people. So what's the point for us? Well, the point for us is there will always be distractions and obstacles in our Christian lives. We need to maintain our focus and stay on task in serving Jesus and the church because there'll always be distractions. Wouldn't it be nice, you know? Wouldn't it be nice if it was always nice out? But there's going to come, I remember in Montreal, you know, there was one winter, Roger and I, or the other preacher there, in Montreal, one winter. I mean, I was keeping score by the end of the winter, and you know in Montreal, winter starts like psh, October, and it goes all the way to April. Every single Wednesday night, it would snow. It would start out, three o'clock in the afternoon and it was snowing. It would tie up traffic on the way home. Or it would ice rain, or it was slushy, or it was windy. The weather was always rotten on a Wednesday. Why? Because we had our service on a Wednesday. And we said, we're going to build attendance. We're going to man, plan some great classes, activities. We're going to have supper. We're going to serve supper. It's going to be great. Snow. <laughs> Somebody said, why is God doing that? I said, well, he likes to mess with me, that's all. That's all. He sees, oh, Mazzalongo is making a plan. Okay, good. And sometimes we get distracted by that, a small distraction. Like tonight, you know, what? Monday it was 80 degrees, it's Oklahoma. Wednesday it's 48. I'm glad you were not distracted by the weather and came to worship the Lord and to share the word and to have fellowship and to build up your faith. That's how we will cope with all of these things and that's how we find peace and satisfaction. We need to stay focused on what we're about. And then secondly, Jesus will arrive. Mary and Martha fretted over Jesus' delay. The people mourned and they gave up hope. And when he finally arrived, their fear and sorrow were for nothing. He raised Lazarus. We fret, we get all worked up waiting for Jesus to answer, waiting for Jesus to supply, waiting for Him to save us somehow. But we always worry for nothing. Whether in a little while or in the end, Jesus will always arrive. And when He does, He brings with Him comfort and healing and most of all, salvation. So let's not worry. If it's Jesus that we're waiting for, let's be confident that He will always arrive sooner or later, and when He comes, He'll take care of whatever we need.